What an appropriate song as we begin this morning. Would you pray with me as we prepare to open God's Word together? God, this morning we come to another story, another parable. And we pray, God, that as we read it together, as we study it together, that you would draw us into this story. We pray, God, that you would use it as a mirror for us. Let us see ourselves in the story. Pray, God, that through it you would instruct us, you would challenge us, you would prod us, and you would speak to us as we read it this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. This morning we come to another parable. We are in a a short series uh, going through several different parables, and this week we come to the parable of the talents. I don't know about you guys, But when I think about the stock market and I think about investing in the stock market, I get a little bit nervous. You know, I'm a chicken, I guess, right? Because the stock market is risky. Especially back in 2008, we watched as the market plummeted and lots of people lost lots of money. But the stock market, if you really think about it, it performs well over time, right? And most of us know that if, if we have money to invest, it's probably a good place in the long term to invest our money. This morning we come to a parable about investment. A guy's leaving town and he's going to invest his money and we're going to see what happens here. Let me invite you to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 25 this morning. We're going to be looking at verses 14 through 30. I think you'll want to have uh, the scripture in front of you this morning as we study it together. If you don't have a Bible, you can find one in the pew uh, in front of you. We begin in verse 14 this morning. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. Now Jesus is telling the story here and Jesus says again, it will be. Now what is it, right? You're reading this, you go, what is it? Uh, It is the kingdom. Remember last week we talked about the fact that parables give us insight into the kingdom of God. The, The kingdom is what Jesus came to establish. It's what we're living in now and the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is opposed to the kingdom of this world. So we see the kingdom of the world and the kingdom of God. And Jesus is explaining to us what the kingdom of God is like, what it looks like, how we live into it. And he says it, this kingdom of God, will be like a man going on a journey. Now you have to, again, if you want to understand parables, you want to appropriately understand them, you have to understand the first century mindset. And in the first century, if a man of wealth Uh, was a man of wealth, he probably traveled around because he had to make business connections in other places. And it wasn't like today where you could hop on a jet, you know, and be across the country in three hours. In that day and time, you would go away, you would make business connections, you would hook up with trade routes and other sorts of dynamics there, and it would take a while. So a businessman would be gone for a long time. And this is what Jesus is talking about here. This guy goes away, and notice what he does. He turns to his servants. Now the word here is the word doulos, the Greek word. And it's often translated as slaves. And he's now going to leave his servants or leave his slaves in charge of his fortune. Now we're reading this and we're going, yeah, I've heard this story before or this makes sense to me. But what we may not understand is that in the first century... Wealthy people would not often leave everything in charge of their servants, okay? They might let the servants, you know, vacuum the house, right, and clean up, make the beds, but they wouldn't let them do the investing. They would hire someone, someone who knew what they were doing to handle the investments. But this guy turns to his servants, his slaves, and look what he does here in verse 15. To one, He gave five bags of gold to another two bags and to another one bag, each according to his ability. And then he went on a journey. You may have a translation that translates this five talents or two talents or one talent. And we talked last week about the fact that a talent is no small amount of money, right? Some scholars say that one talent is as much as 20 years of wages, okay, So you're talking about five talents here. This could easily be a couple of million dollars, okay? 
The two talents is as much as a million dollars. And one talent, even though it sounds insignificant, and we just picture a little small bag of gold, you're talking about as much as a half a million dollars here that he's given to this servant or this slave. Now notice different sums given to different servants. Each based on their what? Ability. Then he takes off. Look at verse 16. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. So the owner goes out of town. The servants go to work. There's no instructions given to the servants. Notice that. They're not saying, well, you should do this, this, and this. They're supposed to take their own initiative here and do whatever they want to do with the money. I guess the master did know what he was doing, right? Because he gave the most money to the one who was able to double the money. The second guy was able to double his money. And then the third guy, he did what? Did not double his money. Now, now let's just think for a minute. Let me back up a minute. You're reading this story maybe for the first time, and you're thinking, I know Jesus is going to teach that one guy gets five, and he returns five. Another guy gets two, he returns two. One guy gets one, he returns one, and everybody's happy, right? It really doesn't matter how much we return. What matters is how much you return in um, percentage-wise based on how much you were given, Maybe we think that's where the story is going there. But as we get to this third guy, Jesus shocks his hearers here. The guy did not invest his money, did not return one talent. He instead approaches the task with fear. He's really paralyzed. He freaks out. He digs a hole. He puts his money in the ground. Instead of investing in the stock market, he puts the money between the mattresses. That's what's going on here. He's afraid of messing up, so he never begins. Well, you might be thinking, at least he didn't lose the money, right? Let's keep reading. Verse 19. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. Now, this sounds like last week, doesn't it? We had the master coming back. Last week, it was a king settling accounts here. The master comes back to settle up. He calls the servants to account for what they've been given. How is he going to respond here? Let's look at verse 20. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. You, you gave me the opportunity, he says, With five talents, with five bags of gold, here you go, ten. Verse 21, his master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Now, you've probably heard this verse before, right? Well done, good and faithful servant. And we read it and we kind of brush over and go, well, the guy did what he was supposed to do, right? I mean, he was, he was given five bags. He returned five more. Everybody's happy. But let's don't breeze by too fast here. What you have to remember is this guy is a slave, right? Dulas, he's a servant. He was just simply doing what he was supposed to do. But the words of the master are incredibly gracious here. This guy doesn't say, you know, good job, Bob. Go back and do your work. Look what he says here. He says, come on in. Share in my happiness. One scholar says that the words of the master here reflect the words of a father to a son, not the words of a master to a slave. One scholar even notes the, 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 the similarity between the language here and the language of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. Come on in! All that I have is yours! That's how the master responds here. It's a striking praise, really, for a servant. Look at verse 22. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. Same deal here. He doubled the money. Verse 23. His master replied, same language, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge 
of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Same deal. Same language. Come on in. You're part of the family now. He's treating the servant as he would a son. Again, a striking praise for a servant, for a slave. Third guy comes in. Now, we already know what he did, right? I wonder how the master is going to respond. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid. I went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. Right off the bat, this guy's throwing out excuses, isn't he? You're a hard man. And he uses this phrase, harvesting where you have not sown, gathering where you've not scattered seed. What does that mean? What he's saying here, what he's accusing the master of, is, is, is I know you like to win. I know like, you like to get ahead in life. I know that if I show up and I don't have at least the one talent, I'm done with you. That's kind of what he's accusing the man of here. So here's your talent. I didn't want to lose it. I didn't want to be too risky. So I'm just giving it back to you. I hope you're okay with that. Now let's pause here for a minute. Let's think about what's going on here. Does this sound reasonable to you? The the excuse of the third servant? I mean, you might be going, you know, these first two guys, they're kind of overachievers, right? You know, the the kid in the class who always, you know, makes the 100%, you know. And here I'm coming in with a B. Maybe that's okay, right? The first two guys, you might even say, are on the winning side this time. But what if the stock market crashes? What if their risky behavior did not prove so advantageous? What if eventually they lost out? What if they did not double the money? You might even say that the, the guy knew what he was doing. He gave the one talent to the guy who didn't do anything, right? You know, oh, that's Ralph. He's pretty conservative. I'll just at least give a talent to him because he, 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 he won't lose it. You might even think that the master would wink at the conservative behavior of the third servant and kind of laugh it off. Even if you think about it, this guy had eight talents that he gave and seven of them doubled their return. You think he'd be in a pretty good mood, don't don't you think? But look at the master's response. It's, It's actually a bit surprising, I think. Verse 26. His master replied, You wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown, you gather where I have not scattered seed. You knew that I like to win. You knew that I like to get ahead in life. Look, he says in verse 27, Well then, you should have at least put my money on deposit with the bankers so when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. You know, this guy is a servant. You really didn't deserve to be having money to begin with. I should have just left it with the bankers. At least I would have gotten interest on the money. And that's what I should have done. For the, ma- for the master, he for a moment kind of brings up the guy's argument that, you know what, you're a tyrant, you're a hard man. And, and he says, you know, if you thought I was such a hard man, you shouldn't have hid the talent. You know, initially, the third servant's excuse might seem believable when you read it the first time. You might think, okay, well, maybe this guy is a hard guy. Maybe he, you know, he doesn't uh, take anything off of the servant. So, so maybe this guy did the right thing. But as the master begins to talk about it, you begin to see that his excuse is nothing but an excuse. That the true reality of who that third servant is is coming up here. He wasn't afraid he was lazy he wasn't cautious he was slothful he wasn't conservative he was idle and the master's surprise response reveals the servant's true condition verse 28 so take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags Jesus jumps right into the lesson here in verse 29. Jesus says, for whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing 
of teeth. Whoa. Pretty harsh, right? This final verse here gives us language that begins to blend this story with the reality of the end of time. These final verses have to do with accountability that each of us is given. No playing around here. The third servant is not welcomed in. He is not invited to share the master's wealth. He is kicked out. He's booted from the household. Maybe this morning you think this is a bit strong. Let's take just a few minutes and let the weight of this story fall on us. See, I love how Jesus teaches. And I would have loved to have seen Jesus on a hillside. I think he probably had everybody just captivated, don't you think? And as he's telling the story, at the very end, he shocks the hearers. And he's left everybody going, whoa, scratching their heads. Maybe they're going, you know, talking among themselves. Wow, that guy really let him have it. He didn't get off the hook. But let's let, the, let's let the parable, let's let the story sit on us for just a moment this morning because there are implications in this story for you and me. Remember Jesus said, again, it will be like. Jesus is telling a story to describe the reality of the kingdom of God. The, the first thing that we learn here in this story is that Jesus is going to leave us in charge. You see, Jesus is going to leave his disciples and we as his followers are like the servants in the story. We're in charge of something. We've been given something. We're servants. We're slaves, right? Jesus could have left it in the hands of the bankers, but instead he left it in my hands and your hands. We've been given resources, we learn here. And as we think about this, we have responsibility for what we've been given. You know, we often don't think that way, do we? We don't think about the fact that we are given kingdom resources and we're responsible to do something with what we've been given. You know, this story is not just about money. It's about all the resources that we've been given. Maybe spiritual gifts, time, talents, abilities. All of those things are given to us by God What are we going to do with them? Maybe God is prompting some of us this morning to step up and to begin to use what he's been, what he's given us. I think we have to discern what God has given us, first of all, right? We have to ask him, God, what do you want me to do with the gifts that I've been given? I assure you that it's more than just sitting in a pew on Sunday morning. What has Jesus left, up, left, left us in charge of and how might we be willing to take responsibility for what he has given us? Secondly, I think we learn in this story that the master's coming back one day. Jesus is going to return and when he returns, you and I will be held accountable for what he has given us. Some of us will be praised for the risks that we took. Others of us will be like the third servant, going, well, I hit it. I didn't lose it, but I don't have a whole lot to show for it. I think of people who have used what God has given them in tremendous ways. A few years ago, Todd and Ann Zeems visited our church. There are two people who left lucrative careers, and they moved to Tanzania to build water filters for those who did not have clean water put their very lives on the line for the kingdom. I think of middle class families in our church who give money to those who are struggling each and every month. Money that they could use for themselves, but they give it away. I think of time spent by some of you tutoring underprivileged kids whose parents don't have the time or are not willing to spend time with their kids, helping them with their schoolwork. I think of volunteers in the friendship class who give up every Tuesday evening a time that they could be watching TV or doing something that they want to do, but they're spending it with disabled adults, providing an environment for them to learn. I think of circle members for teamwork who give time each week to help someone who's who's stuck in the grips of poverty, and they're helping them come out of that. Investments are in time, money, sometimes dedicating a career path 
You see, it's bigger than just church work. I think often we think that kingdom work equals church work. Well, it's bigger than that. Kingdom work is living our lives for the sake of Christ in our community. And again, it is far beyond this church. You know, I spent quite a bit of time on a football field this fall with 10 and 11 year olds and you might think well you know he's just out there hanging out with his his kid and some kids uh, and helping them play football you know but that's kingdom work it can be kingdom work investing in the lives of those little kids a kind word an encouraging pat on the back helping them to realize that someone loves them you see kingdom work is beyond church work. Sometimes churches get so busy, people can't do kingdom work. They're too busy just doing the programs of the church. You see, God is calling us to use whatever we've been given, whatever talents, whatever resources, to further his kingdom in this world. And again, it goes beyond what we are doing here at First Baptist. What have we been given? What have you been given? He's coming back one day, and we are going to be held accountable. He's coming back one day and we're going to stand before him and we're going to present whatever we've done with our lives. Excuses of being afraid will not stand up. Excuses of not knowing are not going to cut it. Finally, we learn from this story that there are pretty drastic consequences for those who have buried what they've been given. The third guy is thrown out. Not because he committed some horrible sin. He's thrown out because he failed to do what he should be doing. See, this parable addresses the fact that God does not wink at our laziness, our idleness, our inability to do the work of the kingdom. You see, the third servant, he said, God, the master, you're a tyrant. You're impossible to please. So I just better be careful. You see, that's false, and the master uncovers that. You see, too often we live life just trying not to sin too much, right? Trying not to do the bad things. But here, we understand that it's more than that. It's about living our lives for the sake of the kingdom. Jesus, in this parable, refutes the approach that God is a tyrant. You see, God accepts us with open arms. God includes the servants. He brings them into the family. God is gracious. God is kind. God is loving. God invites us to participate with him in the kingdom. God is not a tyrant. The third guy's assertion is false. Again, God is gracious and accepting. But we are given resources and we're called to use them for God's kingdom. And when we don't use them, We have no business living in the kingdom. See, the mindset of the kingdom should be risk. The mindset of the kingdom is that we're willing to put it all on the line for the sake of Christ in our world. As we reflect on this parable this morning, I want to make just a few things clear as we close this. First of all, this is not strictly about money. The parable is speaking in financial terms, right? Bags of gold. But the implications are broader than that. It does include money, that's part of it, and some of us have been given resources and we should utilize those resources for the kingdom's sake, but it's not limited to money. Secondly, the point of the story is not the return on the investment. Some have been given more, some have been given less. Money, time, gifts, abilities, and God is not concerned with the amount of the return, it's more about the effort. It's more about the willingness to risk what we've been given. And finally, we learn from this parable. If this parable is teaching us about the kingdom, what this parable says to us is that our lives matter to God. What we do in the here and now matters for the kingdom. And if we're breathing air this morning, we've been given resources. And may we take that life that we've been given and may we use it and invest it in the kingdom of God. May we operate with the understanding that we serve a risky God and he wants to see his servants risking for the sake of the kingdom. God will take our efforts, he'll take our risk, he'll take our work, and he'll use it to build his kingdom. There are no excuses for laziness, 
No excuses for idleness. No excuses for bearing what we have been given. This is a challenging parable, wouldn't you agree? And as we close this morning, may we all ask God to prompt us in those directions. And when he says, go and do this, he lays on our heart, I want you to do this. May we be obedient to what he's calling us to do. May we take responsibility, understanding that he's coming back one day. And when he comes back, may his words to us be well done, good and faithful servant. Would you pray with me? God, we want to say thank you that you've chosen us to be a part of your kingdom. God, may you reveal to each one of us what that means, how we're to live that out, what we're to do, where we're to invest our time, our money, our resources. And God, as you reveal that to us, may we be obedient and may we watch as you expand your kingdom in this world. God, you may be speaking to someone this morning in specific ways. I pray, God, that that person would respond to you and say, yes, Lord, I'm in. Yes, Lord, I'll do it. There may be others here this morning who are questioning, God, what do you want me to do? God, make it clear to those who are struggling, who are searching, who are asking for guidance. Maybe there are some here this morning who have not been obedient, who've taken the talent that you've given them and they've buried it and they're sitting idle. God, would you prompt that person to dig it up and to do something with it. Lord, we love you, we praise you, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. As we close this morning, we're going to sing a song together. And maybe this morning God has been speaking to you in some way and you'd like to come and kneel at the altar and pray, you do that. If there's a decision you'd like to make, a decision like accepting Christ or, or asking, God, I want to be open to you and, and you want to pray with me this morning, you come and pray with me. Maybe you'd like to be baptized, you'd like to join this church. Now would be the time that you would come and do that. Let's all stand together.